uh, competitive literature uh, lecture series. Today's talk is sponsored by the Center for Humanities and Information, along with the Department of Comparative Literature. Before giving the intro introductory duties to my colleague, Eric Hyatt, I would like to uh, announce the next week's luncheon speaker. We will have Jennifer Wenzel, Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature and Middle Eastern South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University. And she will speak on to us an oil inventory. So now Eric will introduce us today's distinguished speaker. Hi everyone. Um, so uh, N. Catherine Hales. Uh, Kate Hales um, is a uh, professor and director of graduate studies in the Brahman literature. I don't know if, are you still DGS? No. Oh gosh, okay. Well, so I, I read that at, at uh, Duke and also distinguished professor emerita at the University of California in Los Angeles. Uh, she's moving back to Los Angeles. She's going to be emerita at Duke and at UCLA. Uh, so double emerita, uh, which <laughs> is appropriate for someone with uh, so much merit to her name. Uh, she earned her BS in chemistry uh, from Rochester Institute of Technology and their MS in Cal from Caltech, and then uh, worked in the chemical industry for a while, and then at some point made a life switch uh, and, and uh, earned a master's degree in literature and English uh, from Michigan State and a PhD from the University of Rochester in 1977. That transition is really what explains, I think, the arc of her career, both the beginning of her career and the ongoing driving uh, emphasis of her career to bring together uh, knowledge and ways of thinking uh, from the sciences and from the humanities, uh, which she has done uh, over a number of books, I think eight by my count, although I'm counting not the edited collection, so Kathleen, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, but The Cosmic Web, uh, 1984 from Cornell, was her first book. Uh, the book that kind of put her, I think, in some ways on the intellectual map uh, for the whole profession was Chaos Bound um, from Cornell, also 1990, Orderly Disorder in Contemporary Literature and Science. Uh, since then, you can see as, as I read these titles, these books, you'll see her moving through various scientific fields, so cosmic order, or cosmic web, where we get you to astronomy, chaos bound, chaos theory, uh, technoculture, or technocriticism and hypernarrative, especially through modern fiction studies, and then the book that, that really made her reputation, How We Became Posthuman, uh, Virtual Bodies in Cybernetics, Literature and Informatics. Then nanoculture implications of the tech, uh, new techno sciences, that's an edited collection. My mother was a computer, digital subjects and literary texts. Uh, then electronic literature, New Horizons for the Literature, or for the Literary, How We Think in 2012, Digital Media and Contemporary Technogenesis, and most recently in April, Unthought, The Power of the Cognitive Non-Conscious. So if you look at these books, and what you see is someone with uh, a really fine uh, mind moving from site to site, making a difference every time she lands somewhere, and coming back into the humanities uh, every time in ways that transform the way that we think about the various topics of her work uh, and the way that we think about the work that literature does in uh, a world in which it's always part of a <coughs> larger social system that involves the sciences. Uh, what's so remarkable about her work, I think for me, is that um, it, you know the tendency or the, or the easy thing to do so often would be to find in science something and then, and then sort of apply it to the literature as one does or one used to do back when I was in grad school with uh, Lacan, right? So you do Lacan, then you read some novel and say, oh look, I found Lacan in the novel. Ta-da. You can do this. What's nice about this gesture is you can repeat it a thousand times. Uh, but what Kate, Kate's work is, is so impressive for is, is never taking that easy way out, but actually always showing how literature and science uh, interpenetrate one another, how they, uh, in fact, illuminate one another, and in fact, how they co-produce and engage with one another in all kinds of ways. So today, uh, please join me in welcoming Kate for the future of writing, future of humans. Thanks so much. the Center for Humanities and Information for the invitation to be here today and to speak to this uh, lunchtime series. So I'm uh, delighted to be here at Penn State and really look forward to uh, uh, engaged and interesting conversation with you. So the work I'll be presenting today is <coughs> a kind of sequel to my Unthought book, which Eric mentioned just uh, was published this year. And one of the central takeaways of that book 
was uh, to make the argument that um, cognition is not only conscious or unconscious, but also non-conscious, and that non-conscious cognition applies both to biological organisms and to technical systems. So this project takes uh, that book uh, for granted and extends the argument about cognition specifically into media theory and media studies. So the title for this new project is <coughs> Cognizing Media. And by that I mean media which are capable of uh, cognition, but also cognition operating on media. The first part of the book <coughs> is about the cultural implications of moving from print to the point where computational media completely interpenetrate print technologies, and I'll talk about that in a moment, a uh, condition that I call post-print. So <coughs> the first part of this, um, this section of the book traces the history of printing technologies from 1950 to the present to show exactly how this transformation uh, took place. The second part of this part of the book is on uh, publishing, particularly university presses and what difference digital technologies have made to scholarly monograph publishing in university presses. And then <coughs> the third part of this part of the book is on the material I'll be talking about today. The second part of the book is about digitality, changing concepts of media, a chapter on digital media and the law, and the last and maybe most ambitious <coughs> chapter of the book will ask the question, are computational devices capable of generating meanings, of understanding meanings, and are in uh, producing meanings. <clears throat> so part of my argument here is to look at deep assumptions that we currently hold about the human and to make the argument that many of these assumptions evolved with and from print technologies. So in European and Anglo-American contexts, we've had four centuries of print in Chinese context, print goes back much further to the 7th century. But just confining ourselves to European and American context, we can say that we've had roughly four centuries of print. <coughs> and that print is central to assumptions embedded in some of our fundamental institutions, including law, consciousness, and ethics. And I'll just very uh, lightly sketch in how that part of the argument would go without really developing it. So uh, Marielle Hildebrand in her book, Smart Technologies and the Ends of Law, identifies three characteristics that a law has to have to be considered as law in the modern context. First, it has to be explicit, it has to be written down. So we're all familiar with pictures of law offices in movies where you always see the bookcases full of law books in the background. So print and law are firmly entwined in the sense of making those laws explicit. She also says to qualify as a law, <coughs> you have to be able to break it. And third, you have to be able to contest it as a law in, uh, in a court. And her argument is that what she calls data-driven agency fulfills none of these conditions. So we might think about something like the millennial digital copyright law, which allows producers to put into the code certain restrictions about who can use that document, who can copy it, and to what extent it can be copied, and so forth. That would be an example of what Hildebrandt means by data-driven agency. And if we think about code um, that prevents you from copying, say, a portion of an e-book beyond the extent specified by the publisher, it is explicit in the code, but you can't access it. And in fact, the digital <coughs> Uh, law, the Millennial Digital Copyright Law, makes it illegal for you to access that code uh, and its um, 
it's forbidden uh, strictures and illegal also to change it. So it can't be broken and it's not contestable in any ordinary sense. So her concern is that as we leave the age of print, the um, law, formation of law as we're customarily thinking about it may be facing an end. So the title of her book is Upon the Ends of Law, as in what is the goal of law, but also is law as an institution so firmly wedded with print that as we move out of the age of print, law becomes displaced by data-driven agency. So part of the argument here is also that print has had an enormous influence on how we experience consciousness. Of course, consciousness existed long before print or even uh, literacy, but with the advent of print, we get the emergence of silent reading, not as a divergence from usual practice, but in fact, as part of the usual practice. And with silent reading and the smaller books that go with print and the dissemination of many more books, um, self-vocalization begins to operate and to emphasize the sense of consciousness as an interior monologue. So subvocalization uh, takes place by an activation of the vocal cords and the vocal apparatus in the body, but without passing air through it. And so the sense we have when we read of a voice speaking in your head uh, underscores the experience of consciousness as an interior monologue. So this argument would then say, with the advent of print, the sense of consciousness as an interior narrative was greatly strengthened and expanded. So when novelists like Ford Maddock Ford, and Joseph Conrad, and so forth began experimenting in the late 19th and early 20th century with stream of consciousness techniques, they were actually <coughs> representing a mode of consciousness which had itself been strengthened by the advent of print. And now they're recursively reinstituting that in a print medium itself. So print and ethics, we know that print, like language, is a linear medium. It emphasizes causality and the single actor. actor. And so that branch of ethics, which is based on stable values uh, called virtue ethics, was reinforced by the reproducibility of print, the linearity of print, the emphasis on a single actor and on causal sequences. So only with the advent of computers in mid-20th century were we able to get robust simulations of multi-actor agency. Print simply isn't very good at representing multi-actor agency, and so in that sense, print has emphasized that branch of ethics, which is about uh, linear causality. So if we look at the discourse surrounding print now, we can see that it is very confused, or we might say it's very conflicted. So some people argue print is dead. Others argue, oh no, print is very much alive, very much with us. Some people argue print is static. Others argue, oh no, like Jerry McGann, print has never been more flexible. Um, so we have, we have a very confused discourse. And you see this on the screen there. If you can read this, print ain't dead. But of course, we're not reading it as print. We're reading it as an image. And so it kind of is uh, it's uh, self-contradictory. So if we uh, think about the status of print, um, many people will argue that in their experience, reading an e-book is not very different from reading a print page. And I think part of the confusion about print is that e-books are very good at simulating our experience of print, and different people will experience e-book reading in different ways. So part of our sense that there's not very much difference between reading an e-book and reading a print page is that e-books deliberately conceal from us 
precisely the extent of those differences. Computational objects are smart enough to play dumb, and particularly they conceal to us their potential for surveillance. The fact that the ebook knows how far you've read in any text, they know what passage you underline, they know <clears throat> how much time you spent with various portions of the book, they know whether you finished it or not, and all of that data is reported back to the publisher for their own purposes. So I think that if we're interested in the ontological status of print, a media archaeological approach offers a much clearer approach to us than does reader response uh, approaches. And if you ask a media archaeological question, which is, could be paraphrased as something like this, what does this object know and how does it know it, then uh, we get a much clearer sense of the ontological difference between print and ebooks. So in my terms, that would be when print technologies become cognitive. So in, as I'm using the term, print uh, involved electromechanical devices without cognitive capabilities. And in the West, we can trace that from roughly 1300 to about 1950. Starting in 1950, the transition to computational media was initiated by the invention of the Lumatype phototypesetter. And the Lumatype phototypesetter was marked a kind of rupture in print technologies because for the first time it broke the link between metal or wooden typepieces and print technologies, and instead it used a, a, a disk <coughs> inscribed with alphabetic letters and flashed a strobe light down through the appropriate letter of the disk, exposing an image on photographic paper, which was then used to produce the print book. So it's a fundamentally different kind of technology than what Gutenberg used, than what Samuel Clemens used as a printer's apprentice, and it marks the beginning of computational media <coughs> penetrating print. In fact, the two inventors of the Lumatype machine, in effect, had to invent computational components for their machine, being completely ignorant of the independent history of computational devices in the era of around 1950. So <clears throat> beginning with the Lumatype on through uh, the Vakya text uh, developed by Xerox, print began to experience the differences that cognition bestows wherever it operates, flexibility, adaptability, and evolvability. <clears throat> so by, 19, by 2000, convenient date, the transition to post print was effectively <coughs> complete. So in the interviews that I've been conducting with university presses, they're very clear that uh, print is now one format that they deliver along with audiobooks, ebooks, and other kinds of formats. So print has lost its distinctive status as the default format and has become merely one format among any. One of my interlocutors said, we market text, we deliver formats. So that makes it very clear that uh, they understand <coughs> that the text resides in the computational file, not in the format that they're delivering. So it's not only <clears throat> typesetting, but also composition, editing, design, warehousing, distribution, sales, every aspect of print uh, commodity has now been completely transformed by computational media. So why does this distinction between print and post-print matter? By my definition, the bookstore here at Penn State only sells post-print artifacts. It does not sell print artifacts, <coughs> except if maybe there's a fine letterpress book on the shelf somewhere. But it's not just a matter of <coughs> uh, not just a matter of terminology, 
but rather going back to that media archaeological viewpoint, if we think about what these devices know and how they know it, it's very clear that an e-book has cognitive capacities where a print book does not, and that the e-book marks a kind of ontological rupture in um, technological transmission. So uh, one of the books that makes this argument very clear about computational media is Dennis Tennant's recent book, Plain Text, The Poetics of Computation. And many people have said what Tennant says, but I think he says it in an exceptionally clear and engaging way. So he talks about the laminate sign, and of course we're all familiar with laminated wood products, the idea of several layers glued together. So he uses that to talk about the sign in computational media. And he says, the sign plausibly resides both on the screen and on the hard drive. It fractures in some real sense, diverging at the site of its projection from the site of the archive, and then he announces his agenda of his book. I chart the gradual fissure and ultimate illegibility of the newly composite sign. So why, in Tennant's terms, has the sign become newly illegible? Well, he argues um, <clears throat> that some humans have now become only partially literate because we cannot access the deeper levels of the animate sign, of the laminate sign. So that would be true for anyone, for example, who can't access or understand the code. But even for someone who does know the code, there will be levels of the laminate sign which are legally forbidden to be accessed and which are hidden from us as readers. So with the laminate sign, all of us are in a condition of more or less illiteracy. Tennant further says, I realize some of my deepest intuitions about literature rely on assumptions firmly attached to print. And I suspect that would be true for most of us here in this room, that in a way we don't even fully recognize our assumptions about print. Our assumptions about literature are tied to print. <coughs> So now going back to ebook readers, I mentioned that they simulate pages, but of course that's only a simulation, and underneath the surface, software performs actions that control not only what reading takes place, but what meanings emerge. So we know that when we go to a blockbuster movie, say Tom Cruise, and we see Tom Cruise drinking a can of Coke in a way that carefully displays the sign on the Coke can, that that's not an accident, that there's legal contracts that the filmmaker has with Coke products, that the Coke can will appear in so many scenes with so much exposure, it'll have the Coke sign uh, legible and so forth. Well, we're now in the process of developing ebook readers that change the content depending on where you read it, what kind of reader you are, and what your reading preferences are. So for example, if you're reading an ebook in the US, you might have different products mentioned than if you're reading it in China or if you're reading it in Czechoslovakia. In the same way that film now varies the product placement contracts depending on context. If you're a female reader, you might experience different contacts, different uh, contact content than if you're a male reader. And for those e-readers that have GPS, they not only know who you are as a reader, they know where you are. And so the location at which you're reading may also determine part of the content that you're reading. So just to illustrate the point that our intuitions about literature are tied to print, Tennant has this little bit of technospeak to illustrate for us how foreign uh, the operation of the ebook actually is. We have far fewer intuitions about the affordance of inscription at the micromolecular levels. 
As we turn the simulated pages, electrical charges embedded in a solid state medium cross the impenetrable oxide barrier, reaching their destination, the floating gate through quantum, quantum tunneling. Well, I happen to teach a course with a particle physicist on science fiction, science facts, so courtesy of that I actually know what quantum tunneling is and how it relates to the floating gate. But for many of us, this would simply serve to illustrate how foreign the actual operation of the ebook is. So Tennant further says, our grasp on the medium weakens the more convincing its simulation. The more convinced we are that the simulated page of the ebook reader differs in no significant way from a print page, the less we are able to engage critical inquiry into the nature of what it is that we're reading. So now I make a, make a segue into the chief topic I want to talk about today. What are the cultural conditions that catalyze rethinking the human as something other than the symbolic species, the species with language? So as we know, humans for millennia have congratulated ourselves as being the species that has more linguistic capacities than any other species on Earth. Clarence Deacon defines humans as the species capable of symbolic thinking, symbolic language use. But now we're confronted a situation in which our cultural context is beginning to chip away at this vision of what the human is. So what are the catalysts that begin to energize these challenges to humans as the linguistic species? Well, one of those is the new illiteracy. The idea that with the laminate sign, we become partially illiterate, unable and incapable of access accessing the full dimensionality of the complex sign. But there are other catalysts as well. So as we know, Highly formulaic writing now, like finance reports and sports reporting, is done not by humans but by algorithms called robo-writing. We know that much of our writing is now subject to surveillance with email, for example, with things that we send over the internet, uh, the revelations of Snowden now about the extent to which um, our messages are being surveilled by the government uh, makes us freshly aware that writing now is not a private act communicated privately to other humans, but goes through a whole technological apparatus in which it's being surveilled and read without our knowledge. And then finally, <coughs> increasingly, reader reading is itself manipulated by algorithms so we have natural language processors now, like the now never-ending language learning pro program at Carnegie Mellon, capable of reading text in the wild on the internet 24-7, drawing inferences, categories, and conclusions from what it reads. So these are the catalysts that underlie a work like <clears throat> The Silent History. So the silent history appeared first as an iPhone app that you could download. I think there were two episodes released each week. Um, and so these are the catalysts that underlie a work like <clears throat> the silent history. So the silent history appeared first as an iPhone app that you could download. I think there were two episodes released each week. Um, and the interface looked like this. Uh, there were the archives, which were the narrative sequences that uh, were released on a downloadable basis. There was the condition. So what is the condition? The silent history describes a moment in the near future when a generation of children is being born uh, children who can neither understand language, learn language, use language, or comprehend the language that their parents speaks to them. And these are called the silence, or the silent generation. 
So silent history obviously is a kind of oxymoron. None of the silents themselves can write their history because they can't use language. So their history is written by the adults surrounding them. Um, and they themselves, instead of communicating through language, begin developing their own system of communication using microfacial gestures. So let's take a look at a portion of the, well, in, in a moment we'll look at a portion of the prologue, but in crowdsourcing fashion, the creators of this postprint production invited uh, people to submit what they call field reports, reports that took the basic narrative and extended it, adapted it to local circumstances. And you could access these field reports through your iPhone, but only if you were at that geographical location. So they had contributors from 62 countries that uh, expanded this narrative in various directions. But you, you only know that if you're at the site. So only after the whole uh, sequence of downloadable episodes was over did the print book appear. So in contrast to other, other sorts of productions where there's a film adaptation of a preceding print book, here the print book is belated. It comes only after the iPhone production was complete. And even though the print book now is a bound object with inked pages, what I call the mark of the digital is everywhere apparent in this print book. And I won't have time here to fully expand on why that is so, but I'll just simply make that statement. So now I'd like to introduce some vocabulary from my previous work that will, I think, be useful in considering the nature of this post-print production. So in my book, Writing Machines, I introduced the idea of a technotext, where the form of the text is technologically produced, is entangled with the text content. And here you see a page from Steve McCaffrey's typewriter poem, Carnival, so you can see it consists entirely of symbols from the typewriter using either black or red ink, but it has a striking visual form and the, the work is advertising its technological production by a typewriter and entangling that with the content of the work. So in my terms, this would be a technotext. So now we can add yet another syllable with this and talk about the echo technotext. And that is when the technological <coughs> form of the text is entangled both with its content and with its ecological conditions of production. And so in these terms, the silent history, because it has a cultural context which is catalyzing its major premise, is an echo technotext. So we're all familiar with these alphabet blocks used to teach children uh, the alphabet. This is what it would look like if you were a member of the silent generation. So here you have Tim Roth demonstrating for us microfacial gestures. Um, so uh, in a book called Honest Signals, the author argues that these kinds of microfacial expressions are extremely difficult to fake. They emerge spontaneously when we're engaged in conversation, and they involve so much <coughs> concentration to fake that <coughs> most of us produce them and recognize and respond to them without consciously thinking about it. So we have here six uh, stereotypical um, affective or emotional states that are conveyed by micro expressions around the eyes, the forehead, the mouth, and so forth. Sadness, contempt, surprise, anger, disgust, fear. I think he overdoes the fear a little bit. But you get the idea that you could actually compose a kind of grammar using these microfacial gestures. So in the prologue, the narrator of the prologue makes this suggestion. 
Is the loss of language a terrible disability, or might, on the contrary, it be a form of freedom? Are words our creation, or did they create us? And who are we in a world without them? Are there wilder, more verdant fields out beyond the boundaries of language where those of us who are silent now wonder? We enter and leave the world in silence after all, and everything else is simply how we walk that middle So this is one of the central questions that the text is exploring. What would it be like to be bereft of language? Are there possibilities that non verbal, non-linguistic humans would experience that is screened or, or um, veiled for us because we have language. So the text revolves around a conflict initiated by a scientist, August Burnham, who makes it his life's work to overcome the condition of silence imposed on these new children. And he develops computational implants that can restore language ability so they're planted inside the brain and increasingly mandated by the government so silent children are implanted by birth with these computational implants. So they're forcibly imposed on the silent children even if their parents object. And worse yet, they, because the implants are computational, they run through a central server farm and they make the thoughts of the children available for surveillance and even coercive intervention. So the climax of the text comes when um, one of the advocates of the silent generation bombs the server farm where all the implants uh, our network through. And as a result, the children who were implanted by birth and who only experience consciousness through the linguistic production produced by the implant suddenly become like wild animals. They're uncontrollable. Their parents have to pin them up in electrified pins. Government agents can control them only using cattle prods. They're simply unavailable for any kind of reasonable discourse or discipline until the double silent slash, he's double silent because both of his parents are silent, he's a silent so he's never known uh, a regime of language, puts on a helmet and is able to communicate with all of the implanted children. His name is significant. He doesn't have a name. His parents don't have a name for him because they're non-linguistic. But the adults around him who do have language call him Slash. So his name is a punctuation mark that divides both and, either or. He puts on the helmet and is able to send a signal so clear to all the implanted children that they suddenly become tractable. And here's August Burnham working with a young girl, and he sees this transformation. I saw something, a flickering that passed across her features. It was as if I saw her go from animal back to human. I don't believe there's a word in our language, or perhaps any language, for what I saw on the girl's face. It was the primal spark of a mind recognizing itself. So the message that Slash sends out is not a verbal message, but the message in its content is something like this. You are conscious, you are human, you are part of the human family even if you don't have language. And it's that communication that is able to effect this enormous transformation in the child. <coughs> So we eventually learn that the inability to comprehend verbal language is in fact caused by a virus. And as the text draws to its conclusion, the virus is spreading. More and more people are slipping into a condition of silence. And it seems that at the end of the text, humanity will enter into a post-literate, post-verbal condition 
And the lingering question as the text ends is, are humans without language still human? <coughs> so what the text shows us then is a condition that we could call post-literacy, a form of meaning making without literacy. So many people have speculated on the end of language. For example, Wilhelm Flusser in his book, Does Writing Have a Future? suggests that alphabetic language will give way to code and alphabetic language will become like hieroglyphs, um, a classical but no longer used um, form of meaning making. In the silent history, we see that embodied communication, gestural language, microfacial language, <coughs> replaces mark making. And so increasingly now, as machines are able to parse well-formed writing, being human means deforming writing. So we've all seen screens like this that often come with the injunction, prove that you're not a robot. And the way that you prove you're not a robot is to use your superior pattern recognition capabilities as a human to read this deformed writing. And then you type the writing back into the box, which is read by an algorithm. And so what we get in CAPTCHA technology then is a recapture of deformed writing back into an inscription that can be parsed by a computer. So in this sense, CAPTCHA co-ops humans back into an alphabetic regime, kind of in defiance of their superior pattern recognition. But what if we had a form of deformed writing that resisted recapture? And that would be what is called asemic writing. So the root seem, as in semiotic, means meaning making. So asemic, a means to negate the semic. So it's a form of writing uh, that resists semiotic uh, meaning. It's ancient. There have been asemic manuscripts discovered as long ago as the sixth century. So we might think of it writing unconstrained by semantics. Now you might ask, why is it writing, not just mark making? Because its form is parasitic on writing. So it's illegible. It can never be captured into an alphabetic understanding. But it's not writing in that sense, but to use a Gramassian subtle negation, it's also not, not writing. And you'll see what I mean when you see some examples of it. Um, so we've had a resurgence of interest in asemic writing in the contemporary period. And many theorists have argued that's not an accident. So Michael Jacob, for example, argues asemic writing captures the techno-anxiety and information overload of a post-literate culture better than traditional forms of literary expression Rita Rayleigh says, the challenge of the contemporary is to allow for and even cultivate a mode of opting out of the regime of techno-linguistic management. So this is uh, just a sheet, an image of one version of asemic writing. So you see symbols that look like they should be parsable into some semantic system. But no matter how much attention you pay to this, they can never be recovered. Henri Marchot was one of the mid-century practitioners of asemic writing. And here you see a manuscript page of his asemic handwriting. You'll see, you see what I mean about it being parasitic on writing form. So you have lines that looks like paragraphs, divisions, but none of those symbols can be parsed. There's also a famous manuscript dating back to the 15th century, the Vanyans manu manuscript, uh, which um, has a alphabet of 26 symbols, 
but it has never been broken, including by the experts at the National Security Agency. So whether the Monage manuscript, 290 parchment pages, is asemic or a code that has yet to be broken is not understood. Uh, but it's a fascinating example of what may be asemic writing. It also describes plants with illustrations that are non-existent, and it's a, quite, a, quite a production. So there's also asemic calligraphy, an example here from Pushan uh, shows you some of that. And then my favorite, the asemic typewriter. So you see how all of the keys of the <laughs> typewriter have been altered. Actually, I don't think that the type pieces have been altered, but you see that the artist has put a page of asemic writing in the typewriter to simulate the impression that the typewriter, in fact, has <coughs> produced this uh, asemic uh, writing. And it's kind of interesting because this is a mechanical production of writing, but uh, nevertheless asemic. So now I come to my conclusion that um, this talk has been arguing that the future of writing and the future of human are entwined. <laughs> that post-print implies conditions of post-literacy, and that post-literacy implies a rupture in the human as it has traditionally been understood. So now we have a condition where media obsolescence, particularly the obsolescence of print, has become entwined with the possibility of human obs obsolescence. So I mentioned natural language processing as a computational practice, no longer a human-only practice. Uh, and different configurations, such as we saw in the silent history, compete for meanings of the human as print becomes post-print. And then I'll conclude with what I hope is a provocative question, and that is, what is the meaning of the AC? So you might be inclined to answer on first thought, the meaning of the acemic is that it has no meaning. But I wouldn't be so quick to conclude that the acemic has no meaning. The meaning of the acemic may simply be resistance <coughs> to writing in a way that can be recuperated into a meaning regime uh, that can be parsed by computers. And in that sense, acemic writing may have a meaning, although it's obviously tied up with the technological conditions of its production. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. So we, we will invite questions from her. Yes. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk and just asking or trying to probe the connection between literacy and writing. It's, it's a long, for those of us who work in um, African literatures in particular, it's a very problematic connection in the sense that we have work with uh, a number of cultures who are incredibly orally literate, but don't actually need to write things down to remember them. Okay, so I guess... So I have a, just a question about... Yes. Because uh, a lot of your argument rests on the connection between writing and literacy. That's correct. Okay, so um, I am assuming a definition of literate uh, that neuroscientists like Stanislaw Dehaene use when they talk about literacy and illiteracy. So for Dehaene, literacy means being able to parse writing. That is the definition of literacy. So he would say oral cultures have histories, they have narratives, they have storytelling, they have many rich resources, but they don't necessarily have a form of writing that corresponds to those oral productions. So he would define illiteracy as being unable to read or write written uh, languages. Right, and but it does also then that that's 
I, I understand that answer, but it does raise the question of the meaning of asemic, being different in what I would call oral literate cultures as opposed to literate cultures. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So this points to uh, what post-literacy would mean. So post-literacy, I would argue, should not be uh, misunderstood as cultures which never went through literacy. <laughs> that the experience of going through literacy effects, effects certain cultural, neurological changes. And when someone loses the capacity for understanding writing or reading writing as in the silent history, that's not the same as going back to exactly. an oral culture. That it post-literacy means you have gone through literacy and come out at another point. And I would even just to <laughs> make one point is I wouldn't say even doesn't mean you haven't gone through. It is possible to think of cultures that don't go through literacy in this way as not being going back to. In other yes. words, there's a certain kind of, we want to get rid of a certain kind of developmental notion of yes. first you're, you're yes. orally literate and then you're yes. written literate and then you're yes. post-literate. Absolutely. Because yeah. that's a completely I, colonial construction. Yeah, I would yeah. completely agree with that. Okay, thank you yeah. for clarifying. Uh, I had a question uh, about some of the kind of categorical shifts that you're uh, describing because the way that I'm trying to understand them is often through historical examples which seem very parallel but from other moments. So for instance, um, one of the things when you're talking about the idea of the laminate sign um, that comes to mind is the, the similar move that people uh, in the 1980s, I think, 1990s, had in, in cultural materialist studies where the move to the print shop, where they were trying to, in literary studies, uh, reveal this alienation of labor in the print shop that affected the very thing that we were studying and perhaps had another layer of meaning. Um, it seems like a very parallel moment to this idea that like, oh, we can't read the code, or, or if we can read the code, then we can't read the binary, because there's always something beyond. And uh, that kind of bracketing uh, is something that I think criticism is always involved in, that is, that is kind of zooming out and trying to include a new context. So the gesture, I understand the gesture of this notion of the laminate sign, but I don't see it as a categorical yeah. New moment. Similarly, the, the idea of, of the, the app uh, that you were showing us, the, the new history, um, it, it reminded me of uh, Althusser's uh, uh, um, ideological state apparatuses, right? You have this, this idea of this implant being forced upon people, right? So, so the, the fact that this is something that's sort of already uh, thought about, right, in terms of schooling, right, just which goes back long before Al Althusser as being a kind of state apparatus that's giving us a certain ideological way of seeing the world just seems to be literalized in this sort of uh, speculative fiction. Okay, so I would argue that studies of print shop technology, the way labor is distributed, how that affected the flow of materials through the print shop to result in the print book and so forth, are invaluable parts of the cultural context of printing technology in that era. But even though those cultural contexts can be recovered by looking at a wide variety of cultural materials, uh, nevertheless, I think they simply fall in a different category than what Tenen is talking about with a laminate sign, where you have a surface of language and underneath that you have um, code, uh, code protocols. So what are those differences? Well. With uh, printing technologies, you need a variety of access to other kinds of cultural materials to understand what went into producing a print book. Uh, but with the laminate sign as Tenen is describing it, those could also be referenced in terms of the labor practices that produce the laminate mm -hmm. sign. But the laminate sign in itself has a depth that the printing, printed book does not have. So he talks about the laminate sign being compressed when you print a book for page from a digital file, for example. 
then it can't be expanded anymore into its full, uh, full dimensionality. But there's simply a difference between electronically generated text in that regard and any kind of printing technology. It may be interesting, I think, to do a sort of comparative study. How, do, how does the division of labor in a printing press compare to the division of labor to produce coding protocols, for example? But I still think there are different categories. Yes? Really grateful you talked about death, because um, my question is very much, very similar to, to Dr. Abel's question, and I'm just going to reveal right now that I'm a medievalist, and that's sort of the perspective I'm coming from. But a lot of what you talked about seemed very similar to me to conversations about medieval allegory, in which there's this question, right, of the layer of meaning and sometimes the multiple layers of meanings underneath the literal, and this deep concern <coughs> that readers aren't going to be literate enough to understand those multiple levels of meaning and might be very distant, in fact, and all from those, those lower levels of meaning. But also this question of the shift between the manuscript to the printing press and the kind of distance that gets established between the person who's writing on animal skin and like physically writing and doing the labor for that versus the person who's writing, uh, using the printing press. So I wanted to ask you how you see the depth of, of electronic text being different from the depth of sort of the, the more metaphorical, I guess, depth of meaning and distance between the reader and the meaning of the text. So uh, we could easily imagine an ebook that made use of all kinds of metaphors and um, allegories. Uh, to access the full cultural meaning of that sign or that text. So we could imagine situations that would be analogous to the manuscripts you're describing that make full use of allegory and so forth. But in addition to the cultural understandings uh, of what those allegories mean, how they're generated, how they affect the significance of the text and so forth, there's a technological dimension of the laminate sign, which doesn't depend on that kind of cultural allegory, but is electronically and computationally generated. So there would be, I think, ways to think about these two together, and maybe that helps to explain why uh, many times people interested in manuscript culture have very intriguing and interesting conversations with people interested, for example, in electronic literature because they see the analogies there. But uh, I think, again, there's a difference between the technological generation of those substructures of meaning and the cultural generations of those subtexts of meaning. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, so really fascinating. My background is in law and ethics, so I'd love to come back at some point with the bits that you didn't unpack at the beginning are really interesting to me. But a couple of quick points. One, I was really puzzled by the move in the silent history to focus on uh, micro-expressions, because the work of Paul Ekman tells us that actually, with a very few exceptions, we're all terrible at decoding micro-expressions. <laughs> Apart from a few wizards of deception, we can't tell when other people are lying by looking at their faces. And Ekman himself can only figure it out if he records you talking, plays the video very slowly, and then breaks it down. So it seems to me a strange move. I thought the move would be something more like a move towards emojis or something, <laughs> as the, especially since the technology is more likely to separate us from each other. We're going to spend less time looking at each other's faces and more time looking at our devices. The emojis are a fascinating uh, path not taken by the silent history. So let me comment on that uh, in a moment. But I think the idea here is just as uh, a blind person might develop a more acute sense of sound than sighted people do because one sense is taken away, that the silent children are able to discern expressions that adults can't read or understand because they've lost the capacity for language, so this is their mode of communication. But <clears throat> if we think about emoji, most of the emoji that I am familiar with are digitally generated, like in Moby Dick, written exclusively in emoji, for example. 
Um, so in that case, what you have is what appears to be a return to a gestural language, but it exists as a laminate sign, which is digitally inscribed and has the, all the sublayers of code that any other electronic sign does. But the way these authors imagine it is not as emoji, but as uh, embodied communication that is in resistance to digital technologies. And that's made very explicitly, made very explicit in the text when Burnham wants to do, develop the digital implants. Then you get um, a conflict of silent parents who don't want their children implanted, don't want them digitally surveilled versus uh, the government's uh, mandate that all children have to be implanted. So they could have gone in that direction. It would have been a different book if they had. <laughs> But uh, they, they chose to remain with embodied uh, language. Yes? Yes, uh, I, I, I enjoyed your talk very much. And I just wanted to raise a very quick question about the, the, the relationship between post-literacy and being post-cultural in a certain sense. Because you probably know about a case of a certain Chinese artist called Xu Bing. Who, is, who has this whole idea about a, a, a kind of writing that's very similar to the academic writing that you presented. Like he, he would show you uh, Chinese characters that's entirely made up by him. It's just a kind of corrupt Chinese character writing. It's called Book of Heavens because it's supposed to be illegible for everybody, even right. for Chinese speakers. And then there's also another book from, uh, called Book of Earth, like, right. he, the, like the narrative about the airport signs. Yeah. Right? So there was this idea that even though you are, it is post-literate in a certain sense, but it's definitely not post-cultural because the guy is definitely trying to evoke a certain sort of culture behind it, like Chinese culture being ancient or like airport culture being international. Right. So I would like to see how you see the implications post of the post-literate in relation to um, human culture yeah. in different senses. Mm -hmm. So that's a central issue in this book, The Silent History. But what we see in the course of the narrative is that the silents have developed their own rituals. So wedding ceremony is performed, for example, bonding ceremonies, family recognition ceremonies. So they definitely have a culture, but it's not a culture that involves language. So um, you're perfectly right that post-literacy in this text does not imply post-cultural. Uh, they are in a condition of culture, but it's a radically transformed condition of culture because it's a culture generated and transmitted without language. This is a very minor question. When the author of Silent Hill describes the passage in silence as a middle passage, do you think that he or she or they, I guess it's three of them, right, but do they, do they know? what the Middle Passage historically means, or not, or rather, or, or what, are, what are they, I mean, I guess, there's two questions, there's what do you think it means, what's, what's, what's happening there, and what do they think it means? Well, I don't see how you could write right, the Middle either, Passage so. without knowing right. about so what's the Middle the, a Passage in terms of slavery right. and so forth. So, okay, so you, the Middle Passage in a slavery context is the ocean voyage on one side, you have the African culture, the ocean voyage on the other, side of the condition of slavery in the Americas. Um, so when they write that uh, we begin in silence and we end in silence, and the middle passage is, uh, everything depends on how we walk the middle passage, something like that is what they say. So I think the evocation of slavery there resonates with the rest of the passage in terms of um, what we might uh, understand as the prison house of language, but now not in the Jameson sense, but in the sense of being caught within language. So I think that they are imagining a kind of freedom uh, in contrast to slavery of language. So I do think they understand that, and I do think they mean that allusion to resonate within that passage as a whole. Not just my interpretation. Well, I think the time is up. And again, thank you so much. Thank you.